Hello, everyone. Um, hello. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Alice Shapley um, to our final official colloquium of the season. Uh, there is one more unofficial colloquium that will happen next week at 3 p.m. Note the time change. Uh, year 11 will be here for an unofficial colloquium. Um, but this is our last official colloquium and we're really going out with a bang with Alice. Um, Alice is a professor at UCLA. Um, she is uh, one of the, uh, if not the pioneer of um, our ability to uh, detect high redshift galaxies. Um, her paper on the subject has like 1200 citations or something absolutely ridiculous like that. Um, she, um, so she's an expert in understanding um, the properties of early galaxies and that's what she's gonna talk to us about today. She's the um, one of the PIs of the MOSDEF survey most staff really let's be real here um uh she previously um was uh magna cum laude i found out looking at your cv on the internet um at harvard university for undergraduate she did her um graduate work at caltech um, she was a Miller Fellow at Berkeley. Uh, she was very quickly snapped up by Princeton. Um, she was briefly a professor there before moving back to the great state of California. Me, Where you got to meet Zach. <laughs> the best thing that happened at Princeton. Yeah. Um, I am delighted that she has come here to visit us today. She's going to tell us about the MOSDEF survey and all the really exciting results that have come out of it. Everyone, please welcome Alice. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for such a lovely introduction and for having me here and also for being so flexible with the scheduling. Um, so first I should check like if the mic is working okay. Is that all right? Yeah, it's okay. Um, all right, well, yeah, no, it's been a real pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna tell you about the MOSDEF survey or maybe a slightly, a slightly, a slightly more inspired title is about insights into the physical properties of galaxies at high redshift. So first I want to start by um, highlighting my collaborators, uh, specifically the co-PIs of the MOSDEF survey, um, Mariska Creek, Naveen Reddy, Brian Sayana, Allison Coyle, and Barra Mobasher. And then um, I also want, I'm going to be talking a lot about the work of my former grad student, Ryan Sanders, who's now a Hubble fellow at UC Davis, and he's amazing. So I'm going to highlight a lot of his cool results. Um, and we had a lot of other wonderful uh, grad students and postdocs um, working on this project. Um, okay, so uh, we got a lot to do today. So so let's uh, let's get started. Um, um, I am going to be talking primarily about galaxies at redshifts two to three, um, also called the cosmic noon. Um, and uh, so I want to um, set the stage a bit about this part of the universe's history, just because we have a, a range of people who study different types of astronomy. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, so um, this redshift epoch, redshift two to three, hosts the, the peak in both the star formation and black hole accretion activity in the universe. Uh, as uh, charted here in the, the Medell uh, diagram, showing the star formation rate density as a function of cosmic time, uh, peaking at about redshifts two to three. Sorry. <laughs> and this is uh, just a proxy for the, the uh, black hole accretion activity as a function of cosmic time. You can see it also peaks at about redshift two. Um, and so at these early times, there are qualitative imprints of the local galaxy population. For example, there's a bimodal distribution of galaxy colors. There are blue galaxies and red galaxies. Also, the red galaxies are the most strongly clustered. Um, but there are also big qualitative differences in the galaxy population at cosmic noon. So for example, there's a big diversity among the most massive galaxies in the universe. They're not all quiescent and dead. Um, we have an absence of cold quiescent disks like our Milky Way. There's no real analog of that um, at early times. Um, just the overall uh, level of specific star formation rate. So star formation rate normalized by stellar mass that's elevated by an order of magnitude at these early times. And also we see that the gas content of galaxies are different, both are very gas rich and also they propel very energetic gas outflows. So let me just go through these, uh, these aspects of the redshift to universe, just as I said, to set the stage. So first of all, one thing to know is that redshift two galaxies are more actively forming stars. So there's a well-known correlation between the star formation rate of galaxies and their stellar masses called the main sequence of galaxy formation. And this main sequence evolves towards higher redshift. So in particular, the star formation rate to, for a galaxy of 10 to the 10 solar masses um, 
will be an order of magnitude higher at regif two than at regif zero. Um, another way of looking at, at this is you could say that star formation rates of tens of solar masses per year are common for Milky Way mass galaxies in the early universe, whereas they're very rare um, today. Um, if we want to zoom in on the most massive galaxies in the universe, uh, we have a couple of ways of thinking about uh, this population. So this is one of my favorite uh, plots by my collaborator, Mariska Creek, um, uh, plotting the color of a galaxy versus its stellar mass. And you know, in the universe today, the most massive galaxies with stellar masses above 10 to the 11 solar masses, they are primarily quiescent, we call them red and dead. But at redshift two, you can see that above 10 to the 11 solar masses, there's a diversity of colors, also specific star formation rates, also structural properties. So even at the massive end of the galaxy population, there's a lot of activity going on. Um, this plot on the right, it's a little bit busy, but maybe it's another sort of like global way of looking at this. So this plot is charting the abundance of galaxies of different masses. So let's just zoom in on two sets of points. These blue stars, which are, this is the number density of galaxies more massive than 10 to the 11 solar masses versus redshift. And then the orange is the abundance of, um, these are star forming massive galaxies, okay? And then these orange uh, symbols are quiescent galaxies above 10 to the 11 solar masses. So you can see today, above 10 to the 11 solar masses, most of the galaxies are quiescent. At redshift two, most of the most massive galaxies are star forming, okay? So it's two ways of looking at this, this, uh, this um, idea of galaxies are more actively forming stars, even among the most massive ones that are dead today. Um, okay. Um, so the next thing I want to say is that redshift two galaxies are smaller than those today. So galaxies of fixed stellar mass are smaller. Now, Ren Cease will tell you that the evolution shown in these plots is too dramatic because this is looking at galaxies um, in terms of their half-light radii. If you look at galaxies in terms of their half-mass radii, uh, the evolution is not as extreme. But I think even Ren would agree that at fixed mass, galaxies are smaller at earlier times, okay? But it's just not quite as dramatic. Um, if you look on the, on the right, uh, this is the size evolution for star-forming galaxies. Um, um, you can see they, they go to smaller sizes, you go to higher redshift. Um, uh, furthermore, um, more massive star-forming galaxies, these galaxies are more massive than 10 to the 10 solar masses, they're characterized by exponential profiles. So Eric can tell you much more about that than me um, and Ren. Um, uh, but if you go to the lowest masses, um, there's more discussion about what the, the structural properties of these low mass galaxies are. Maybe they're more triaxial and not disc-like. Um, so another really cool plot in terms of um, just representation of data um, um, is this is a, now we're going to look at the dynamics of galaxies in early times. So this is a compilation by Natasha Forster Schreiber and, and Stein Weitz in their really nice review and annual reviews showing. So this is again the main sequence of so star formation rate versus stellar mass. But here, every galaxy that's plot, plotted um, has an integral field unit map, kinematic map of H alpha emission. Okay, so you can use that to study motions in the galaxies. Um, and hopefully what you can see is that a lot of the galaxies are characterized by this well-defined gradient, like a rainbow, you know, from red to blue. And that's a, that's a sign of rotation, okay? So these IFU studies uh, suggest that the majority of these redshift two star forming galaxies above 10 to the 10 solar masses appear to be rotating disks. Uh, perhaps at lower masses, the disk fraction is lower. Okay, but the thing that's interesting is that even, even though rotation appears to be common, these disks are really not analogous to the Milky Way because they have rotation speeds, sometimes 200 kilometers per second, uh, but they're very turbulent. Okay, so you can see on the right here um, that the sort of dispersion, the local velocity dispersion in the interstellar medium medium um, at redshift two to, two to three is tens of kilometers per second, okay? Whereas in the Milky Way, it's like seven kilometers per second, okay? So these disks are turbulent and thick. And so one of the really interesting questions is what's the origin of this turbulence, okay? It's a well-known feature of high redshift disks. Okay, um, what else? Okay, so gas flows are really common in galaxies. It's a corollary of them having very active, intense star formation rates. So star formation rates in very uh, much in smaller areas. Um, and we know this from various uh, ways. Um, so let's maybe we'll just look at one of them. So this shows a plot of, um, these are what we call down the barrel spectra. So basically a spectrum of a galaxy. So where the galaxy starlight is passing through its interstellar medium and circumgalactic medium. Okay, and each one of these vertical dotted lines is showing the systemic velocity of the galaxy, like the center of mass of the galaxy. And you can see that these interstellar absorption profiles, so that's foreground gas, are blue shifted. 
And that is the kinematic signature of an outflow along with red shifted Lyman alpha emission. Okay, now the thing that's really interesting is that these blue shifted interstellar absorption lines are detected in the vast majority of star forming redshift two to three galaxies. And so this is what's kind of funny is that, so um, Ben Oppenheimer can tell you if you go to a galaxy and gas meeting, there'll be lots of pictures of M82, right? Like this is one of the, are the favorite pictures, but like at redshift zero, this may be a good description of an outflow, very collimated, you know, expanding out of the galaxy perpendicular to the disk. Um, but the fact that these outflows seem to be detected so commonly at redshift two galaxies suggests a much more spherical geometry for the outflow. So maybe this picture of M82 is not the right one for redshift two to three outflows. And that's an interesting question because we need to know about the geometry to infer like how much mass is going out of the galaxies. Um, okay, so sort of a, a, another related uh, uh, topic is the gas content of galaxies. So get redshift two to three galaxies are very gas rich in terms of their, their molecular gas content uh, compared to redshift two galaxies. So CO observations, you know, like um, uh, with IRAM and ALMA uh, suggests that these uh, star forming redshift two galaxies um, have molecular gas fractions typically of 50% or more at, you know, if the stellar mass is like 10 to the 10 solar masses. Um, and, uh, you know, the molecular gas fractions of star forming galaxies of the same stellar mass today are an order of magnitude lower. And you can see here, this is a plot of the gas fraction. So that'd be the gas mass over the sum of the gas in the stars versus stellar mass. Okay, it's a lot of words, but the main point is that this purple line is low redshift and basically that gas fraction increases steadily as you go to higher redshifts. And not unrelated to that is the fact that the galaxies are forming stars much more rapidly. Okay, so this is just, these are just some of the key properties of the galaxy population at these early times. Um, but, you know, the, wh what are the questions that like keep us up at night, those of us who are studying galaxy formation and evolution? Um, we want to know how stellar mass and structure are assembled in galaxies. You know, how much is from in situ star formation versus mergers. Um, we want to understand what the physical processes are uh, that drive star formation in indiv individual galaxies, what causes star formation to set on and, and then to, to, to fall off. Um, we want to understand how galaxies exchange gas and heavy elements with the intergalactic medium. And of course, I'm not going to cover this so much today, but we want to understand the nature of the co-evolution of, of black holes and stellar populations. Um, and so I guess my goal today um, is to first tell you you know, try to convince you that looking back in time 10 billion years is a, is a good, you know, good, good approach for trying to answer this question before all the galaxy population properties are set. Um, but also what I really want to tell you about is why rest optical spectroscopy is a very effective tool for trying to address these questions. Okay, rest optical spectroscopy. So I have to say rest because I'm always looking at high reg. If some people who study the universe today can just say optical spectroscopy. Um, so, so what are the key features that we use? Well, on top, I'm showing the emission line spectrum of a nearby star forming galaxy. So we have our key suite of emission lines. So this is oxygen two, this is H beta, a bomber line. This is oxygen three. We have H alpha, N2, and S2. So this is like our usual suspects for trying to decode what's going on in these galaxies. Um, on the bottom, we have a couple of examples of um, uh, galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, sort of a, a younger galaxy and an older galaxy. We're looking here between 3,700 and 4,400 angstroms. So we have bomber lines. You can see the bomber lines, they have emission lines sitting on top of them in the younger galaxy question, but they're these like divots here. These are the bomber lines. Um, we have the calcium H and K lines. We have sort of collectively the 4,000 angstrom break, um, magnesium B at longer wavelengths. So these are, these are measures of the um, stellar and gaseous contents of galaxies and they sort of they they form the the basis of traditional uh classic optical spectroscopy of galaxies um now the the um the, the key here though is that if you want to go back in time to when the universe was hosting its peak level of star formation activity okay so let's say beyond about a redshift of 1.4 um the bluest of these features so the oxygen two line at 37 27 angstroms this moves past 9,000 angstroms okay so the goal of studying these lines becomes a problem for near infrared spectroscopy okay and uh what's really exciting is that about a decade ago i used to say just recently but about a decade ago there was a major development for those of us who wanted to make such studies of the early universe. And this is basically the commissioning of the MOS fire spectrograph on the Keck telescope, on the Keck 1 telescope. And so that's what I want to spend uh, my time telling you about, is I want to tell you about how we used the MOS fire spectrograph to conduct this project called the MOSFET survey. 
Um, I want to tell you specifically, uh, we did a, a wide range of scientific applications in MOSFET, but I want to tell you about the stuff we did at UCLA to study the baryon cycle um, and high redshift. Um, and I want to tell you a bit about what we're going to do in the future. Um, okay. So when we were trying to think about how to best use this wonderful instrument, um, we think about, well, if we were going to do a census of the early galaxy population at cosmic mean, like what would, what would be some of our key requirements? Um, well, we want to study some of those features that I was telling you about, the emission lines and absorption lines uh, that tell us about the gas and stars and dust in the galaxies. So we want to cover the rest frame range around 3,700 to 7,000 angstroms. Um, we said we wanted a large sample. So large is you know all in the eye of the beholder but at this point for such studies of the early universe you know the samples were in the tens to hundreds and they're very heterogeneous so we wanted to make a homogeneous and order of magnitude improvement uh in terms of the numbers sample um which meant a thousand um at redshifts you know one and a half to three and a half um and uh, we wanted to cover multiple redshift bins to enable evolutionary studies and i'll show you an example of a nice evolutionary study that ryan sanders did okay and so i'll show you how uh the mos fire deep evolution field or mos def survey um achieves these goals uh, but first i just want to give a little bit of an ode to the mos fire spectrograph because it's just so wonderful um, and this is the multi-object spectrometer for infrared exploration. So the co-PIs of this wonderful instrument are Ian McLean, my colleague at UCLA, and also Chuck Seidel, um, who's at Caltech. Um, and MOSFIRE enables near-infrared, i.e. 0.9 to 2.5 microns uh, spectroscopy over a field of view, about six by three um, arc minutes. Um, you do MOSFIRE observations one band at a time, so the Y band, the J band, the H band, and the K band. Um, and uh, the thing that's really cool about MOSFIRE um, is it's multiplexing, and also the way it does the multiplexing, like you can configure your slip mask basically in almost real time. Um, and so, um, yeah, so you can, you can basically do up to 46 galaxy slits or star slits or planet slits, that wouldn't be that practical um, at once um, um, using this cryogenic configurable slit unit. Um, and for those of you who care, the resolution is 3,500. So that's better than 100 kilometers per second using a 0.7 arc second slit. Um, this is an example of uh, um, some data that you get uh, from MOSFIRE off the, off the telescope. You can see all these rectangular regions are different slit spectra. Um, okay, so this is a Beautiful spectrum, right? Okay, but it's not our galaxy spectrum. So, so does anyone know what we're looking at here in the H band? Yeah, it's the sky. Okay, right. So, so unfortunately, this is not this is not what our galaxy spectrum like. Uh, but we we dither between uh, short exposures, and then we can subtract off the sky. And you can see here popping out these are little um, H alpha emission lines from galaxies at redshift two. Okay, so you have to basically chop between two different positions and then subtract the sky off and then you get your galaxy light. So the thing that's worth knowing is that their MOSFIRE provided a sensitivity boost of at least a factor of five relative to the previous kick instrumentation, the other NER spec, <laughs> which has a different capitalization from the one on, on JWST. Um, and uh, so basically what it provided was a uh, emission line sensitivities of a few times 10 to the minus 18 ergs per second per centimeter squared in two hours. Okay, that number means nothing to you. Um, I'll just say that that number, the a few times at the minus 18 ergs per second per centimeter squared is a star formation rate of about one solar mass per year at redshift two. Okay, so that's, that's you know, that's great. Um, in practice, uh, we don't use all 46 pairs of bars at once to make 46 slits, but we do typically have about 30 slits. Okay, so if you pair the increase in sensitivity with the multiplexing factor, you can see that MOSFIRE provides an increase in survey efficiency relative to the previous instrumentation of more than two orders of magnitude. Okay, so it was a real, as we think, game changer in terms of our ability to survey the early universe with a multi object medium resolution spectrograph. Um, all right, so I don't want to bore you with the details of the project, but just I just want to give you a sense of what we did. Um, um, so again, these are my partners in crime. Um, we got a, a large allocation of Keck time. That's why there were six of us because we need to band together to get a lot of time because um, we weren't at you know Caltech or something. Um, and we had almost 50 nights of time between 2012 and 2016. Um, the idea was to target regions of the sky where there was already a lot of multi-wavelength data uh, that had been assembled. So these are these HSD extragalactic legacy fields um, like Goods North and Goods South and 
Cosmos and UDS um, and Aegis. These are fields that have vast suites of existing multi-wavelength data. And so the idea is that we are piggybacking on these existing data, adding our MOS fire spectra, and then getting a very rich view of all the galaxies that we're targeting, as opposed to sort of like looking in random place and then be like, oh gosh, we have to figure out like how bright that galaxy is in the near infrared. Like we already knew this. Um, we, uh, yeah, so, so we, we looked in a few uh, key redshift ranges, 1.4 to 1.7, 2.1 to 2.6, and 2.95 to 3.8, spanning look back times of about nine to 12 billion years. Um, and you can see here's our, our redshift histogram. So we targeted about 1500 galaxies um, and had a very high success rate in terms of redshifts. Um, this is showing our histogram of redshifts. You can see about half of them uh, were at redshift two in this central uh, redshift region. Um, and we used the wonderful 3D HST survey for our targeting, which also had uh, catalogs and uh, redshift estimates. And this was really critical so that we made good use of the, the MOS fire time and didn't put slits on garbage. Okay. Um, and so I wanna motivate why we were looking in these specific redshift ranges and it has to do with our atmosphere. Um, so you can see, again, these are our principal redshift ranges. Um, the sweet spot is at redshift 2.1 to 2.6. And this is because those strong um, rest optical emission lines that I mentioned before fall within windows of atmospheric transmission. So the oxygen two line falls in the J band, H beta and oxygen three fall in the H band, H alpha, nitrogen two and sulfur two fall in the K band. Um, at redshift, um, one and, a, one and a half or so, you can get the same set of features, but like shifted one filter to the blue. So the same thing I said, except in Y, J, and H band. Now, redshift three, um, because of the thermal background in the atmosphere, we don't get H alpha, okay? But we do get oxygen two in the H band and H beta and oxygen three in the K band. And, you know, this is, uh, this is still, you can still do a lot of stuff. Um, so I wanna show you, um, I wanna show you some of our, our, our data. Um, um, these are just some examples of galaxy spectra that we collected for redshift two galaxies, um, along with their beautiful existing multi-wavelength um, spectral energy distributions, you know, spanning from the rest UV up to the rest frame near infrared. We can use those SEDs to learn about the stellar populations of the galaxies. And these are ordered from basically the youngest, call highest specific star formation rate galaxies to more mature galaxies and dustier galaxies as we go here. This galaxy over here is a galaxy about uh, uh, which my collaborator Mariska, Mariska Creek wrote a nature paper. You can see this one actually has absorption lines. Usually the galaxies are too faint uh, to measure stellar absorption lines. But for this one, Mariska actually looked at the chemical abundance pattern of the stars in this galaxy. Okay, but for the most part, we're looking at the emission lines and then the, the, the broadband spectral energy distribution. And the thing that's really interesting is that there, you can see, maybe you can, maybe you can, maybe you can't, um, as you go from these young, less evolved galaxies over here, um, you can see the shape of the spectral energy distributions changing. But you can also, if you look closely, you can see the emission line ratios changing from there's H alpha with very little nitrogen two. And then over here, you can see the nitrogen two to H alpha ratio is much higher. And the same thing goes for some of the other emission lane ratios. And then, so this is the 1D spectrum. On top of it is some actual 2D spectral data that we collapse into 1D. Um, okay, so now I've told you a little bit about the spectrum, but I, 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 want, I want to teach you a bit about, I mean, I don't know, maybe you already know, but in case you don't, I want to talk a little bit about what it is that we're actually learning from these spectra. Like, what is it that you learn from a galaxy when you get one of these emission line spectra? Okay. Well, you know, as you may know from taking or teaching an ISM class, uh, you know, the emission lines that we are seeing provide a very powerful probe of H2 regions. Um, you know, and so locally, um, it's possible to obtain long slit spectra for individual H2 regions. So for example, this is a plot from, from the chaos survey showing slits on, you know, tens of individual H2 regions inside a nearby spiral galaxy. But that's not what we get at high redshift. It's actually not even what you get for local galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, right? So here we have an example. So, so Sloan has a, um, a fiber that goes on the central region of the galaxy, okay, that corresponds to six kiloparsecs at a redshift of 0.1, okay? Um, ironically, um, the MOSDEF slits of 0.7 arc seconds provide a similar sort of physical region of the redshift two galaxies. That's what I'm showing on the right. So, so then what is it that we're getting when we take an integrated spectrum of one of these galaxies, either a fiber spectrum from Sloan uh, nearby or a redshift two galaxy from MOSDEF? Well, we're getting you know, a galaxy integrated quantity. So this is this surface brightness weighted ensemble average of all the H2 regions and diffuse gas in a galaxy. Okay, so that's a caveat. I'll, I'll come back to it a little bit later. Um, but 
keeping that in mind, let's say we, we put that aside a little bit and then just say, well, what are some of the properties that we measure from this spectra in this surface brightness weighted ensemble average way? Well, you get a measure of the interstellar dust extinction from what we call the bomber decrement. So that's the ratio of H alpha to H beta. It tells you how much dust is, is reddening the light. Um, once you know the reddening, you can take a line like H alpha, and that tells you about the instantaneous star formation rate in the galaxy, you dust correct it. Um, as we'll spend a lot of time later on, for better or worse, um, if you measure a bunch of these uh, rest optical emission lines, you'll learn about the oxygen abundance in the galaxy, so the chemical enrichment in the interstellar medium. Some of these other features, like these oxygen two and sulfur two doublets, their, their ratio is actually sensitive to the density, the physical density of electrons in the ionized interstellar medium. Um, there's also something called the ionization parameter, which tells you about the intensity of radiation relative to particles in the uh, in, in H2 regions in the ionized interstellar medium. Um, and uh, and that is also that is also uh, you can infer that from the ratio of different ionization stages from the same element like oxygen two and oxygen three. Um, of course, you can also look at AGN activity. If you look at different ratios of these lines, like in what we call a BPT diagram, Baldwin, Phillips, and Trilovich. Um, and, uh, and so that tells you about the, the radiation field that the gas in the galaxy is subject to. And also when you have a spectrograph like MOS fire, um, it has good enough spectral resolution that you can actually use the profiles of the strong emission lines like H alpha or oxygen three to tell you about motions in the galaxy. So you can look if you, let's say if you have a nice Gaussian profile, you could use the line width to learn about the dynamical mass of the galaxy. With MOS fire, you can even decompose these H alpha emission lines into a, a narrow and a broad component. And the broad component would might be the signature of a gas outflow. And we've looked at that too. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting stuff you can do with the line profiles. Okay, and so keeping this in mind, um, um, there's a lot of science that you can do, right? So you can look at with, with a data set like the one we assembled with MOSDEF, okay? So you can look at star formation and the growth of galaxies, dust attenuation in galaxies, uh, metallicities and physical conditions, the cycle of baryons, dynamical masses and galaxy structural evolution, um, AGN accretion and black hole galaxy coevolution, stellar abundance patterns and galaxy assembly histories, and more. That's not even all there is to it. So we've 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 produced about 50 publications. And actually, I'm not going to have time to talk about it. Actually, I was just too lazy to update my talk. I'm sorry. Um, but we just had three papers that came out about ALMA data. So this has been the latest fun development with MOSDEF is that we have papers by Ryan Sanders another, and another postdoc, Irene Chivet, and then a collaborator, Gergo Popping, who've looked at the dust masses in these galaxies, the molecular gas content, um, and also how um, metallicity and dust to gas ratio are related. I'm really excited about these papers too, so that they're, they're, they're also out. Um, anyway, the other thing that, that I wanna mention is that if any of the stuff I'm talking about today is exciting to you, you know, you can do your own analysis of the MOSF spectra because they are all uh, publicly available along with our emission line catalogs. We promised the NSF that we would do it, so we did it. Okay, um, right. So, so what I want to what I want to do now um, is I want to tell you about our efforts to um, study the metallicities and physical conditions in the interstellar medium in these galaxies, um, and what the implications are for the cycle of baryon. So, basically, how gas flows through galaxies, you know, both into galaxies and out of galaxies, which I'd say is probably one of the big outstanding questions in galaxy formation, which is how does gas get into and out of galaxies, and what does that mean for the regulation of star formation in galaxies? Right. So this is the sort of like, why should you care part of the talk? You can tune out for the rest of it, right? Um, and okay, I'm sure you guys have taught a class using Bennett at all. You probably recognize this plot from like chapter, what is it from chapter 14 about the Milky Way? Chapter 20, okay, chapter 20. So this is, Oh, oh, you just do the solar system part. All right. Um, it's a, this is a great plot. This is a great plot. Um, are you like contractually ob obligated to use? It's a great tech. I love it. I love it. Anyway, so, um, so, um, so <laughs> anyway, okay. So, um, so this is just showing what happens in the ISM in terms of like the cycle of chemical enrichment, right? So we have atomic gas. It cools into molecular gas. You have something like the pillars of creation, out of which young stars are born. Okay, inside the stars, you know, we fuse. Uh, we, we, you know, there, we fuse, um, we have nucleosynthesis, and then as stars die, either through gentle processes or supernovae, we return the products of nucleosynthesis back to the interstellar medium and the whole thing 
happens again, right? So successive generations of stars will be made out of gas that's, that's more and more chemically enriched. However, that's only part of the story. Stay, stay with me, it's only part of the story. Um, so um, this would be treating a galaxy like a, a closed box, okay? But of course, galaxies are not closed systems, right? So this is a snapshot from a uh, cosmological simulation showing the site of a galaxy forming, okay? So now the center region is showing star formation and that will be reflecting all the stuff that I just showed you. However, we have to take into account the fact that gas is accreting onto the galaxy. And then because of what we call feedback from star formation, gas gets propelled out of the galaxy, okay? Now, gas gets propelled out of the galaxy, but remember, we just talked about it. Metals are produced in the process of star formation. We just saw the cycle of chemical enrichment. Now, probably not that many metals are getting accreted. This gas is probably more pristine. Ben can tell you better than I could. Um, but we know that metals are definitely going out of the galaxy. Okay, so the point is that if you measure the oxygen content in the galaxy, it will be reflective of these different processes. Okay, and it might actually give you some constraints on this cycle of baryons, which as I said, is I'd say one of the ongoing outstanding frontiers for understanding galaxy formation. Um, okay, right, so the oxygen content of galaxies reflect this integral of past star formation and also the gas flows into and out of the galaxies. Okay, well, what, how do we actually try to quantify this in practice? Um, so um, one of the ways that we do this is, what we call, is with what we call the mass metallicity relationship. So this is showing metallicity in terms of oxygen abundance. So that's for the rest of the talk. When I say metallicity, I just mean oxygen abundance in the interstellar medium versus galaxy stellar mass. And this is a very famous rendition of it from Tremonti et al with 53,000 galaxies from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, another really nice version of the mass metallicity relationship comes from Andrews and Martini, where they use direct oxygen abundances. We'll be talking about that in a couple of minutes. Um, and it's just showing that um, the vertical axis actually depends a little bit on, on how you measure your oxygen abundance. But the, anyway, these are just two ways from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey where people have looked at metallicity versus mass. Okay, and the point is that the variation in the metal content, the oxygen abundance of galaxies um, as a function of stellar mass is reflective of how gas cycles through galaxies, specifically the process of inflows and outflows and star formation. Um, so specifically, it turns out that the dependence, excuse me, of oxygen abundance on stellar mass is sensitive to things like the galaxy outflow mass loading factor. So basically that's the mass outflow rate divided by the star formation rate um, and how that property depends on galaxy mass and redshift. Another way of looking at it is, uh, this is from uh, Davey et al, 2007. Um, and this is showing metallicity or oxygen abundance versus mass um, as a function of redshift. So here's redshift zero and you go to higher redshift. And the point is that there are predictions in this cosmological simulation of galaxy formation for how this mass metallicity relationship evolves. Um, and they depend on how star formation feedback and other key galaxy processes are implemented um, in the galaxy formation model. Okay, so the idea is that the evolution of the mass metallicity relationship will be sensitive to some of these key galactic evolution processes. All right, so how do we measure metallicity in galaxies? I kind of said it like really in a hand wavy way before, um, but I want to talk a, a bit about it because it's actually non-trivial. Um, so ideally uh, what we do is we would measure direct metallicities. So when you measure a direct metallicity um, as shown, this is a, a, a plot of the spectrum of a, uh, this is an H2 region in a nearby dwarf galaxy. Um, the best way to do it um, is what we call, if you can measure, uh, so is a direct metallicity. And that's when you can measure this really weak line from oxygen 34363, along with the stronger sort of more famous oxygen lines like 5007, okay? Because it turns out that the ratio of 4363 to 5007 is sensitive to the temperature. Okay, because it's like the level population in that upper level relative to the middle level. And if you know the temperature, you can use an equation like this to convert your emissivity of oxygen and bomber lines into basically the number density of doubly ionized oxygen relative to hydrogens. Okay, and you can do the same thing with singly ionized oxygen. Um, and this is what we call the direct method, method based on physics, based on atomic physics, like Osterbrock or Spitzer. Okay, now the problem is that direct metallicities are very hard to measure um, at high redshift. So typically, historically, they've been too hard to measure at redshifts greater than one. Um, and so we use, rather than the method based on physics, I say we use the method based on astronomy, okay? Um, and so we use calibrate, that's my bone big joke, yeah, yeah. Okay, we use calibrated ratios of strong emission lines, okay? And that's what's shown here um, on the left. We have the direct metallicity for H2 regions, and then like the ratio of emission lines that's easy to measure across cosmic time, okay? Um, and so, uh, so this is one way we have of doing it. So we have like the real metallicity, direct metallicity versus N2 to H alpha or O3H beta divided by N2H alpha. And you can see that there are correlations here, 
Okay, and so that's one of the methods we have is like using these calibrations. You can also use photo ionization models. Okay, um, and there are some very sort of like common ratios that are used for doing this. This is a larger compilation um, from Kirchi et al. Just lots of different line ratios that you can measure um, versus the physical quantity. Okay, so there's N2, O3, N2, N2, O2, R2, 3, O3, G. It doesn't really matter. It's just the, the point is that these are quantities that can be measured across a wide range of redshifts. And then locally, they've been connected to a physical quantity, which is the oxygen abundance. Um, okay, so now before we get into um, like the, the issue about metallicity evolution, I just want to say like a couple of empirical facts. This is, this is not a matter of dispute. I think everyone would agree on this. Um, so the point is that when you go back in time, you look at to redshift one, redshift two, um, what you see is that at fixed stellar mass, um, both oxygen three to H beta and O3 to O2, these are both measures of the excitation of the gas or the ionization parameter. They're both elevated for galaxies of the same mass. Okay, and that's shown here. So this is O3 to H beta versus mass. The gray histogram is Sloan. The green points are redshift two. Same plot, O3 to H beta versus mass. The black histogram is Sloan. And then the color points are redshift three galaxies. Um, this is O3 two. So this is like ionization parameter measure. Um, again, we have stellar mass. The gray histogram is Sloan. The red points are redshift two. Okay, so you can see elevated, um, you know, evidence for elevated excitation um, at these earlier times. Now, a simple explanation is that galaxies have lower metallicity um, at fixed mass, um, and we're looking at evolution in this mass metallicity relationship because it turns out that metallicity and excitation are anti-correlated. Okay, so, so lower metallicity H2 regions tend to have higher ionization parameters and higher O3 to H beta. That's just based on the way um, that ionizing radiation gets out of the stars and, and, and the temperature of the H2 regions. Um, the other thing you can see here is that as a function of increasing stellar mass, you can see the O3 2 decreases, and that would be consistent with basically metallicity increasing as you go to higher stellar mass. Um, now, we have to wonder, and there's been a lot of discussion about whether this can just be explained by galaxies being lower metallicity um, at fixed mass, um, and uh, that probably the answer is no, but I'll get back to that um, at the end of the talk. Um, okay. So now if we just stick to empirical space, I'm sorry, I think the feng shui of the slide is not ideal, but I wanted to keep things sort of consistent with the next slide. Um, but just empirically, what I'm showing here is like line ratio versus mass. And this is from Ryan Sanders' paper from last year. Um, and the green points, um, the green points are our best estimate for Sloan um, in, these are in stacked, stacked points. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the sorry, the blue squares are our stacks from the MOSDEF survey at redshift two, um, and then the green triangles are our stacks from the MOSDEF uh, survey at redshift three. Okay, and you can see at fixed mass, okay, the high redshift galaxies are elevated in these line ratios. Okay, and so just empirically, this is evidence for higher excitation, higher ionization parameter, lower nitrogen to oxygen ratio at fixed mass. Now, what Ryan did was he used sort of our best method for converting these line ratios into an oxygen abundance. Um, and so now what we have is a plot of oxygen abundance versus stellar mass. Okay, and then these green points again are our best estimate for Sloan. There's a subtlety here between the green and the gray, but I don't want to get into it. If you're really curious, I can, and there are no other questions, I can explain it later. Um, but um, yeah, so this is Sloan. And you can see that at fixed mass, the high redshift galaxies have lower metallicity, lower oxygen abundance. Um, and uh, the, the offset is typically about 0.3 to 0.4 dex um, uh, relative to redshift zero. So about a factor of two uh, lower in metallicity at fixed stellar mass. Um, okay, right. And that there's sort of a small evolution between redshift two and redshift three. Um, now, one thing that's kind of cute um, is by mistake, we targeted a galaxy at redshift four because we thought it was at redshift three and a half because we had an erroneous redshift. Um, and we actually estimated a metallicity for this galaxy at redshift 4.4 4, uh, based on oxygen and neon lines. Um, and that's kind of exciting. We had a sample of one. So why not make a mass metallicity relationship with one galaxy? Um, and that's here. Why not? Be bold. Anyway, whatever. Um, so, so the thing is that um, this is nice because this is sort of a preview of what's going to become routine with JWST. It's going to be easy to measure metallicities beyond redshift four. This is completely uncharted territory now, but it's going to be easy using the other NERS spec, the new NERS spec that has a lowercase PEC at the end. Um, and so it's kind of fun that we were able to do this in 2017. Um, anyway, um, yeah, and this galaxy looks to be pretty low metallicity. But the, the problem when you have only one galaxy is you don't know whether it's typical or not. It turns out this galaxy is not typical. But anyway, okay, um, right. So I just told you about the mass metallicity relationship. 
what I said was fairly uncontroversial. I think most people would agree that it, as you look at a, the galaxy of the same stellar mass at earlier times, it has lower metallicity. Um, so that's MZR, mass metallicity relationship. Let's introduce our next acronym, which is the FMR, the fundamental metallicity relationship. Okay, it turns out that when you look at the properties of galaxies, there's a secondary dependence of metallicity on star formation rate. Okay, so here what I'm showing is stellar mass, metallicity on the vertical axis, stellar mass on the horizontal axis. Um, and you can see that the metallicity is increasing, but you can also see now that the sample has been divided by star formation rate. And so at the same mass, galaxies with higher star formation rates are displaced towards lower metallicities, okay? And this secondary dependence is called the fundamental metallicity relationship um, as discussed in Ellison et al, 2008, Minucci et al, Laura Lopez, Yates et al, okay? So this is a fundamental metallicity relationship that basically you need to know both a galaxy's mass and its star formation rate to estimate its oxygen abundance. So there are a couple of key questions about the FMR. Um, so one of the questions is, well, what does it mean? And why might you observe this? Um, the other question is, does it exist and or remain constant at high redshift because the fundamental part of the FMR was used in these early papers, papers to argue that this relationship among mass, star formation rate, and metallicity didn't evolve over cosmic time. Okay, and there was a lot of discussion about that. Um, okay, so let's talk about the explanation. And this is from uh, that paper by Deve et al. So what we're looking at is deviations in says specific star formation rate, but at fixed stellar mass, it's the same as star formation rate. So basically we're looking at higher than average star formation rates and, uh, sorry, deviations from the average star formation rate and deviations in the average metallicity. And you can see what's shown here is that basically as you go to higher than average star formation rates, you're just placed to lower than average metallicities. And that's just what's, that's just another way of plotting this, right? Higher than average star formation rates push you to lower than average metallicities. Okay, so why might this happen? Well, I think I'm just gonna read you the text from Dave et al because I don't think I could say it better than Ramil. So it says the physical explanation for this second parameter correlations with star formation rate is that an increase in gas accretion will bring in metal poor gas while fueling new star formation. And conversely, a lull in accretion will result in an evolution more similar to a closed box that will raise the metallicity quickly by consuming its gas. Okay, so you get more gas, it dilutes the metallicity, makes the star formation go up and the reverse. Okay, so that might be why you'd see this and it might be reflective again of this like gas fueling, gas flow processes in galaxies. Okay, so the question is, does this exist and or remain constant at high redshift? So the answer is yes to both, okay. Um, and so this is really cool. This is another plot from Ryan Sanders's paper. So this is the plot on the left from the simulation. So deviations in star formation rate, deviations in metallicity, and this is our empirical version. So higher than average star formation rate goes along with lower than average metallicity. Okay, and Ryan measured this beautifully at redshift too. Okay, so the same cor anti correlation between star formation, delta star formation rate, and delta metallicity holds at redshift too. So the same correlation, I actually do mean the same, not just any correlation, right? Because we could see this anti correlation, but maybe it has a different normalization. But the thing that's really interesting is that actually it's the same relationship um, at redshift two. Now, I'm apo I apologize for just taking this plot from the paper because it's complicated, but let's just look on the right. Okay, so the vertical axis is oxygen abundance and the horizontal axis is this combination of stellar mass and star formation rate that comprises the FMR. Now the black curve is the best fit to redshift zero and these large symbols are the ones from redshift two and three. You can see that while not used in the fit, the redshift two to three galaxies follow the same FMR as redshift two galaxies, all right? And that's a sort of important result here um, that this same, relationship seems to be obeyed um, across redshift two to three. Okay, so now, um, all right, whatever, this is a really busy plot. So I got to justify why I showed it to you with some type of big picture implications. So first of all, I want to say something that I think is important about this, which is that our journey to that these results was a long and winding one. And while it sounds sort of banal, um, it's actually it actually turned out to be really important to get the metallicity calibrations right. So I mean the translation between the line ratios and the 12 plus log over, over H. Okay, so previous work, even by our group and by others, so 
uh, Ryan's earlier paper and also the one by Trancasa et al. actually claimed very significant evolution in this FMR between redshift two and three. And this is because of sloppy use of metallicity calibrations. Okay, so we used very carefully like the right metallicity calibrations, I would argue, for redshift zero galaxies and high redshift galaxies. And this enabled us to make this careful statement about the FMR. Okay, what else? Okay, oh, this is the worst bullet. Let me just do it closely. I mean, let me do it slowly and make sure that I say it clearly. The slope of this mass metallicity relationship is set by something called the metal loading factor. So that's just basically the mass outflow of metals divided by the star formation rate. Um, if the outflow metallicity is similar to the ISM metallicity, okay, then basically you can also use the slope of the mass metallicity relationship to tell you about the mass loading factor, which is one of the sort of holy grails of outflow studies is to understand the rate at which mass is leaving the galaxy, okay? Um, and so we measure that mass metallicity slope. Um, and so we can get some constraints on this mass loading factor, which is higher for lower mass galaxies. And this type of thing we could compare with like the simulations that Ben does. Okay. Um, so why does the mass metallicity of relationship evolve towards higher redshift? That's something that everyone would agree upon, but like what's going on here? And it turns out that it's driven both by the increase in gas fraction in galaxies. So remember I said before, they're much more gas rich and also this metal loading factor. Okay, so metals are both more diluted by the gas rich ISM and they're also more efficiently removed from the galaxies. Both processes are important and they're different. Um, the other thing that's worth keeping in mind is that the fact that the, the fundamental metallicity relationship doesn't evolve, evolve um, it means that if you know the stellar mass and the star formation rate of the galaxy, then you also know its gas fraction and its mass loading factor. Okay, that doesn't evolve from redshift zero to redshift three. Um, and then I probably the most important thing is that galaxies are remaining close to equilibrium among gas inflow, outflow, and star formation rate over the last 12 giga years. So out to the redshift where we can study it out to redshift three. So it means they're not being like swamped by these inflows of gas that like, that are not sort of responded to in time by the star formation rate and the outflow, that the same interplay of these processes is going on um, over 12 billion years. Um, okay, so, so that's cool, that's fun, um, but you know, we wanna do better in terms of the metallicities. Um, and so in the last, um, the last few minutes of the talk, um, I wanna talk about our, our journey of measuring metallicity, they're called metallicity issues, which is something that we agonize about. I didn't think I could subject you to a whole talk about it, but I did wanna impress upon you um, how important it is because it's guiding what we're doing uh, going forward. Um, okay, so the question is, so remember I showed you those plots that showed like metallicity versus strong line ratio. Um, but those were based on, there was a paper by Patini and Pagel. Um, those were based on measurements of nearby H2 regions. And then there was also a plot of uh, Sloan galaxies. But let's start with just the H2 region. So the, the idea is that we're using nearby H2 regions and that translation between line ratio and metallicity. Um, and the question is, you know, can we use that same translation, translation between line ratio and metallicity and apply it to a redshift two star forming galaxy? Um, right, okay, I said that already. Probably not, um, but it's actually like a more fundamental problem, okay? So the question is, can we even do that at redshift zero, right? Like, let's let's think about what's going on, right? Um, remember I told you before, like when you have a redshift zero galaxy, like a Sloan spectrum, like we're really looking at the aggregate of H2 regions and diffuse ionized gas. And it actually turns out that like a single H2 region is not a good analog of an entire star forming galaxy. Okay, so that's worth keeping in mind um, when people apply some of these calibrations to galaxies over cosmic time. In fact, I'd argue that redshift two galaxies are better analogs of H2 regions than redshift zero galaxies because a redshift two galaxy, do you know that a redshift two gal in a redshift two galaxy, the star formation rate surface density on average is about a hundred times higher than it is in a redshift zero galaxy of the same mass. Okay, because the star formation rates are an order of magnitude higher and then the galaxies are significantly smaller. So the intensity of star formation is really high. Um, and when you have that situation, it's like the galaxy is kind of like one big H2 region. And that's a different situation from what you see in low redshift um, where there are large pockets of the interstellar medium which are more characterized by diffuse interstellar gas with significantly different line ratios. Okay, so that's something that's worth keeping in mind. Um, so now, I really could have given you an entire talk about the BPT diagram, but I really know that it would have a limited audience. So I'm trying to do bigger picture. Um, but you know, we have these diagnostic ways of studying 
um, emission line spectra for H2 regions and galaxies. And probably, you know, one of the, the, the most famous one is what we call the BPP diagram, right? And that's a plot of the oxygen three to H beta versus N2 to H alpha. And this is the sequence of star forming galaxies. And this is the so called AGN plume, right? And so one of the things that was really exciting, we found this, you know, 15 years ago, um, was that high redshift galaxies don't follow the same sequence as Z of zero galaxies. And this is, this is uh, from Stidel et al. 2014, showing the redshift of two galaxies and the redshift of zero galaxies. Um, this is a plot from my paper from a couple of years ago. Um, so again, showing the redshift of zero galaxies and then these red asterisks are the redshift of two galaxies. Okay, so, so we, we all agree that the high redshift galaxies don't follow the same sequence of emission lines. Um, and, and again, that gets to that question of how analogous are these local systems to the high redshift galaxies? And the, the maybe perhaps the more important question is, why did the high redge of galaxies not follow the same excitation sequence as local galaxies? Like, what is that actually telling us? Um, and so this is sort of a nice cartoon by Lisa Cooley, again, showing the O3 to H beta and then 2 to H alpha, just showing how different physical properties can move you around in this emission line space. So like, for example, um, if the physical density is higher in the interstellar medium, that will sort of like shift galaxies a little bit. Um, if the ionization parameter is higher um, at fixed metallicity, that will also like shift things up here and to the left. Um, if you have a harder ionizing radiation field, that will also sort of shift things um, off of the local sequence. And of course, since this diagram involves nitrogen, if you have a different abundance pattern in terms of nitrogen and oxygen, that will also move things around. So the question is, what's going on? And we actually had a lot of confusion about this for many years. Um, the thing that's nice about MOSDEF is that we can actually make measurements of things like the electron density. Um, and this is interesting because we found out that the typical electron densities in these redshift two galaxies was about 250 per cubic centimeter as opposed to 25 per cubic centimeter locally. So that's a factor of 10 offset in electron density. It also turns out that the electron density or the pressure, if you prefer it, is not a very strong determinant of where things are. So it, the, the emission line ratios only depend weakly on the density. Um, but we've now made a gazillion different emission line diagrams. Uh, we've thought about, we've, we've modeled also the, the massive, uh, the, the spectra of the massive stars in these galaxies based on rest UV spectra. Um, and I'd say the, really the, the best insight came in Chuck Seidel's paper from 2016, um, but we've done a lot of work sort of solidifying this interpretation. And the answer is that you can explain all the stuff that we see in high redshift emission line diagrams um, if galaxies have harder ionizing spectra at fixed oxygen abundance. And wh why would they have that? Um, um, the idea is that the at fixed oxygen abundance, so nebular gas phase oxygen abundance, um, um, it turns out that the stars have lower ion abundance. Okay, the stars are alpha enhanced. Okay, so their oxygen to iron is higher or their iron to oxygen is lower at redshift two than at redshift zero. Um, why would that happen? Well, if the galaxies are young, right? If the type 1a supernovae haven't gone off as much, you know, the, 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 the stellar uh, properties are dominated by the type two supernovae, um, we will see this enhancement in alpha elements relative to iron. And that will give rise to a harder ionizing spectrum at fixed oxygen abundance. And if you take that into account, you decouple the iron abundance and the oxygen abundance in these early galaxies, you can actually explain the stuff that we see. And it works across many different elements like sulfur, neon, oxygen, nitrogen. We have a really nice explanation. Um, okay, so, so, so great, that's fine we have this explanation, but now I wanna get back to you in the last minute or so, um, what we're gonna do to try to get better oxygen abundances, right? So, so we did our best in uh, Ryan's paper. I said Ryan did his best, it was great um, to look at this mass metallicity evolution. Um, but I think if we wanna do like a really good job and really make sure that we're busly measuring oxygen abundances, I think we wanna do better in calibrating our oxygen abundances. And so what we wanna do is not rely on calibrations in the local universe or finding analogs at redshift zero that we think might represent the high redshift galaxies, but we actually wanna make the calibration between line ratio and oxygen abundance in the early universe, okay? So now I said like, it's really hard to measure auroral lines like oxygen 343, 63 at high redshift, but it's not impossible, okay? And we've done this. So this is an example of Cosmos 1908 at Z of 3.08. And this is our little weak four to five sigma detection of oxygen 343, 63. It's more than three sigma. It's as good as we can do. Um, and we can, uh, we, this is our direct oxygen abundance. Um, based on this one galaxy, it seemed like the, the calibrations between line ratios and oxygen abundance were kind of okay. Uh, but Ryan compiled a larger sample of 18 galaxies uh, 
both from MOSDEF and from the literature with detections of this 4363 line. Um, at the, and that did suggest that the local calibrations were not appropriate for, for high redshift galaxies on average. Now, the problem though, is if you try to do this science from the ground, you're really hampered by both the finite window of atmospheric transmission, okay, because you have to measure this large suite of emission lines, including the weak auroral line, the strong oxygen 35007, H alpha, H beta. It's very tricky to do this. Um, and also the sky spectrum, the sky emission line spectrum, which makes your, your detection of these lines for a faint galaxy very ratty. Okay, I mean, you can see this, um, you can see basically the background of each of these, you know, the spikes in noise. Okay, that's the sky spectrum. Okay. And so it's really tricky. So, so if the atmosphere and the sky are messing up, like for example, this is our, probably one of our best detections of the 4363 line, but at Z of 2.65, we're missing some of the other key features that we'd like to measure because the atmosphere doesn't let them through. Okay, so the atmosphere is not letting them through. The sky background's really bright. What are we gonna do? Well, of course, we're gonna apply for GWST times. And we did, and we actually got a really nice cycle one program to measure these faint lines and do the calibration of the oxygen abundances at redshift, near high redshift, the cosmic mean. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, so we're using the NERSPEC instrument on GWC to do this. Um, uh, this is an example of like a simulated GWC NERSPEC spectrum of a redshift two galaxy. And there are these weak lines here, these weak auroral lines. So not just the 4363 line, but there are some other lines from sulfur two and sulfur three and oxygen two um, that we're gonna use to try to calibrate these uh, these oxygen abundances uh, um, directly. Um, and there are actually two other programs that are doing this. And so, so as I've complained to various folks today, we didn't fare that well in the cycle one schedule, um, but, um, but it's okay, we'll do a lot of preparatory work. So, but we are gonna get the time um, sometime in 2023. Um, okay, so I think that that's, uh, that's the last thing that I wanted to say. I'm really excited about that. I think that'll be really help move us forward towards measuring robust oxygen abundances or like take the next step in constraining the baryon cycle. And I think I'm gonna stop there and just say, um, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that you can learn a lot about galaxies when you measure these rest optical um, emission lines. I didn't even tell you about what you can do with all the absorption lines, but that's, that's also exciting. But today we're just talking about emission lines. Um, also, hopefully I've convinced you that measuring the oxygen abundance in galaxies over cosmic time um, is important for um, constraining models of galaxy formation and the way that gas flows through galaxies. Um, the fact that we've measured the how the mass metallicity relationship evolves and the fact that this fundamental metallicity relationship doesn't evolve. Um, it suggests that star forming galaxies uh, remain close to the same equilibrium among gas inflow, outflow, and star formation rate over the last 12 giga years. Um, the other thing is sort of practical. Um, you know, JWST um, and Roman uh, are going to assemble vast samples of uh, rest optical spectra. Um, and so if we wanna move beyond like measuring line ratios and like measure something physical like oxygen abundances, um, we need to have some real calibrations of the line ratios to the oxygen abundance. Um, um, we also need to keep in mind the fact that galaxies are spatially resolved um, and that's something else that JWC will be great for. Um, um, anyway, so I think with all of these observations so the direct oxygen abundance measurements, these other emission line measurements, I think we're gonna learn a lot of great stuff about uh, galaxy formation in the years to come. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Erica. Let's have one quick question so we wrap up on time, or maybe two, if you're really fast, talk fast. <laughs> Is anyone coming in? Someone coming into the room? Okay. Um, so you said you weren't going to talk about absorption lines, but like do nebular metallicities, if you integrate them up, add up to stellar metallicities at some point? Um, well, so like in the local universe, um, the nebular and stellar metallicities match each other much better. But what's really interesting is that people have looked at the, the uh, we've collaborated with folks from this project called the Vandals Survey, um, and they measure the relationship between iron abund stellar iron abundance and stellar mass. And they find a relationship such that more massive galaxies have more metal rich, more higher iron abundances in the stars, but they find an offset between 
the oxygen abundance and the iron abundance so that basically there's this alpha enhancement at redshift three. But I don't know, is your question like, is there sometime later, like by now in the universe when the two metallicities match? Yeah, I'd say by redshift zero, there's a better agreement. But in the early times, you know, that we're studying redshift two to three, it seems like there is this offset, like 10% solar and yeah. One more question, otherwise we'll wrap up. Yes. Uh, thanks, Alice. Awesome talk. Um, so I was curious about the like fundamentalness of the FMR with respect to environment and whether or not like in MOSDEF you can match to good environmental catalogs and see if things that are in denser environments have higher metallicities. Oh, that's a great question. So actually there is a paper out um, about environment. Uh, it's uh, Chartop et al. Um, and he, uh, Nima looked at the mass metallicity relationship. Oh, sorry, I have to repeat the question. The question is, are there, I, okay, it's okay, okay. It's okay for the Zoom people, okay. Um, and so, um, oh, she was mic'd, of course she was mic'd. Okay, great, sorry. Um, and so, um, so it's tricky. Uh, so there are environmental catalogs for like the, the candle fields. Um, and so uh, Nima, or maybe Nima made the environmental catalogs himself. Um, I think we're at the hairy edge of looking for environmental effects. I mean, people have attempted to do this with slow and it's a very subtle, it's a subtle effect. So I'd say we measured something. I'm not so confident of how robust it is. I think we're going to need a larger sample. I think we're going to need, you know, an order of magnitude larger sample to try and look for these environmental effects because they are, they are small. It's like, you know, a few hundredths of a dex, like 0.05 dex offset in metallicity, you know, for the same mass and star formation rate, and then like environment is the, the other variable. So it's, it's, it's subtle, um, but I think that would be a nice thing to do. Or also like proto cluster versus field, that type of thing too. We've tried to look in, in earlier work, we've tried to look at clusters versus the field. It's, it's, it's tricky, but something to, something to do, I think maybe with Roman, like there will be like lots of environmental measures. And so if we can also measure metallicity from some of the line ratios from the, the low resolution spectra, um, that would be something to do. That would be a good environmental uh, study. Thanks. Thank you, Alice. And I, I want to wrap up on time. I know there's, I'm sure there's more questions for Alice. So I'd encourage people to come down and ask her. Thank you so much for the great talk. Thanks, Let's everyone. give her one more. Thanks. Thanks.